Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight Podcast. Now I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One the consultancy that helps companies create value from data to accelerate growth. And our guest today is Cameron Wirth, CEO and co-founder of SharpEnd. SharpEnd is a retail IoT agency that supports technology adoption with a specialized SaaS platform for connecting non-digital consumer products. In this talk, we discuss the use of QR codes, NFC, and augmented reality by brands to drive consumer engagement and to generate market insights. We also explored the long tail of retail IoT use cases, from enabling in-store recycling of jeans to providing personalized skincare advice via product packaging. If you find these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, you can email us at team at iot1.com. Finally, if you have an IoT research strategy or training initiative that you'd like to discuss, please reach out to me directly at erik.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you. Cameron, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you very much for your invitation, Eric. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this because um, we are two podcast, so two uh, IoT agencies that are, I think, approaching the field from quite different angles. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in here in exploring which parts of our businesses are, are are similar and which parts are different. And I think the, the natural difference here is going to be um, just the, the types of customers that we're working with. So maybe that's a, a good jump off point is to understand, you know, what in your background led you, I think at a, at a relatively young age, right? I know what were you probably mid twenties at that time uh, to establish your own agency focused on a fairly new technology domain. Yeah, I was, um, I was in a I was in a pub in London uh, called the the Bull and Bush, uh, and I saw someone scanning a, a QR code on a beer mat, and I, I had literally no idea what had just happened. But I was like, whatever that was, I think that's going to be the thing that people are doing more and more over the next ten years. For me, the the I, I, I was completely. I mean, this sounds like you kind of make up your backstory to align with your your business, but I was gen, genuinely really really captivated by the idea that a phone had been used to go from a physical object to an online experience. And then even though it was a beer, beer mat and I couldn't really understand the application, I was thinking, well, why isn't that going to be on everything? Why can't you bridge to an online destination from any physical object? And that was kind of really what started my um, fascination with the IoT. I, I didn't know it was the IoT at that point. And, you know, a few jobs later, I'd worked kind of software side, I'd worked on the creative side, so I was kind of working in the mobile team at a big advertising network called the Engine Group, and I kind of wanted to put those two things together because in in the few years since I'd seen that that QR code being scanned, I hadn't really seen many um, use cases of kind of brands adopting these technologies, and I, I was genuinely just committed to, to trying to do my bit to help it scale. So, yeah, I kind of packed in a, a well-paying job. Um, which was pretty cushy um, with kind of long lunch hours and all that stuff. And then, yeah, just kind of looked at the, looked at the space and said, actually, I think the, the solution right now that brands need rather than technology is, is creativity and, and strategic consulting. So kind of set up Sharpened as, as the world's first Internet of Things agency. And, and kind of I was thinking about it very much from a marketing perspective, and I always have, um, looking at it as, a, as an engagement opportunity rather than what I think a lot of people do when they talk about the IoT is think more about the kind of industrial internet industry 4.0 um, supply chain optimizations and all that kind of stuff I think more about vodka bottles that give you recipes and moisturizers that tell you how to use them properly and stuff so I, I, I come at things much more from the marketing end of the spectrum and, and there's a lot more people um, in, in the kind of more industrial side so yeah, yeah, and the industrial side. I, I think I had a very similar backstory. So, uh, I was doing very traditional management consulting. Uh, I think we were we were doing some terrible, terrible project. You know, uh, trying to reduce opex by a hundred million dollars, which in that case meant 
firing a bunch of people and determining who who to you know tag for layoffs basically just again well paid but really kind of you know kind of terrible work and then we encountered this technology that they were just starting to use in the factory and and light bulbs kind of, and I said well that that looks like a much more interesting and kind of uh, heartening set of you know challenges to understand you know and kind of a uh, you know, way to chart my future as opposed to uh, as opposed to this, when you first set up the company, I mean, it sounds like you were somehow inspired by the the prospect there. Were you basically an individual that said, "I'm going to set up an agency and just try to hustle my first customers"? Did you already have a cu- customers off the gate, or did you have one or two other partners to to support you in the setup? No, I mean, I, I was I was working. So so the kind of the so the agency, I, I decided to set up the agency, right? So so the agency was built on the philosophy that. Yeah, you know, originally having come from Engine Group, I was kind of, I was, I, I still am in love with with the kind of advertising industry. I think it's the most powerful industry in the world. I think if you can kind of, if you can make it in uh, in advertising, then you've kind of straddled business of creativity, creativity, you know, applied creativity, all of these kind of things, which are all the areas that I'm interested in. So I really wanted to make it in advertising. That's kind of what I've always wanted to do. That said it was very easy for me to set up an agency because there's no requirements to set up an agency apart from just be a pretty smart person and start to go to clients and say, Hey, I think this could be really interesting for you. Would you like to work together? And it just so happened that absolute vodka was, was our first client. So, you know, flew to Sweden, met the global team, two particular names. that I'll always be really grateful to uh, Vincent and, uh, and Marcus for, for kind of allowing me the faith to kind of explore it. At the time, Absolute was producing 125 million bottles of vodka a year. The, the, the rationale was, hey, let's work together. Let's think about putting a digital trigger onto these bottles. And then you've got 125 million new engagement channels directly with your customers. So that, that was the pitch. And it's really not a – everything kind of makes sense about doing connected products, in my opinion, because it doesn't really cost you too much and it gets you so much upside, you know, customer data, engagement, media value, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the – that was the agency bit. And when you start with Absolute Vodka, it's quite easy to get the second client because people generally look at who Absolute Vodka works with and, and, and tries to emulate. So we had a really, really good couple of years. We went from me to three people to five people to 10 people to 15, kind of settled a little bit probably between the, the sort of 15 to 17 person mark. And then realized kind of as as we started to scale our projects you know by that time we were working with pepsico we were working with um Beiersdorf, we were working with nike we were working with uh, nestle uh, perno recar at that point so we'd gone from absolute across to malibu then up into perno recar and then we were kind of appointed as their first ever iot agency of record which is a big milestone and then realized that actually that the agency bit was the easy bit the, the hard bit was scaling it and, and so what we did is we kind of went to all of the platforms and we were like, hey, you know, we want to go from 50,000 products to 500,000 to 5 million to 50 million. And the IoT platforms were still very much in that kind of hammer looking for a nail mindset. You know, if, if you're an AR company, you're telling every company in the world they need augmented reality. If you're an IoT platform that does QR code management or something, you're telling every brand in the world they need QR codes. If you're an NFC tag manufacturer, you tell everyone they need NFC. So we weren't really finding that the tech vendors could do one of two things. One is be horizontal. They all seem to be backing a certain technology. And the second one was that they they couldn't really speak marketer or brand language. So it was very, very difficult for us to engage the right platform. So we were like, well... I mean, we kind of know what the platforms need to do because we've got all of the world's biggest brands using us and and defining the use cases alongside them. Why don't we build our own platform? So we built our own platform, which is very much now kind of, I think two years after launching, it's very much a kind of an industry standard now. So if you want to generate, you know, secure, scalable, compliant IDs for connected products, you know, NFC, QR, augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of the world's biggest brand owners are now using the platform that we developed. So we've pivoted from being a creative partner into being a SaaS solutions provider to, to the same customers, which is a very interesting model and not one that we're too familiar with that anyone else has been able to replicate. So going from a straight creative business that builds on time and materials to then now being a software solutions partner that has you know one to three year license agreements with you know, 30 seats across 130 countries and we've got billions of touch points and 100% platform uptime and all this kind of stuff. So we're very much now putting ourselves out there as a as an integrated solutions partner. And we're about, I think we're about 40 people now, um, 
but I think I lost track of the business about 20 people ago. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely a lot bigger than we were when before we built the platform. Full-time engineering team, team in New York, you know, we're closing a big investment round now to help us scale into new regions. So yeah, it's just a really nice time to be a part of the IoT space. And especially, you know, since COVID, they kind of changed a lot of these behaviors around how people engage with with physical stuff. So yeah, yeah, great, great timing. Uh, I think you really hit the the timing correct. And I've probably interviewed 150 uh, technology companies on the podcast over the past few years, and the vast, vast majority uh, really came from a tech background, like you said. The, we have a great technology, uh, often a relatively horizontal technology, sometimes sometimes mm-hmm. vertical, but but still typically coming from the tech background. So I think uh, coming from the industry perspective, really understanding the customer needs, uh, it's, a, it's a great starting point. Um, let's discuss those a bit. So um, I think NFC people, you know, QR codes here in Asia, certainly people you know understand what you're talking about. Uh, but there's there's probably a broader set of um, uh, solutions that you might be working with. So what does the landscape look like today in terms of IoT applications for retailers? Yeah, I think the and and again going back to my kind of pauses for thought like i said to you before we started i mean i don't read questions before before podcasts or panels and stuff so i do like to kind of think about my answers but i think the main thing for us is you know the 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 building kind of connected brands is is a creative challenge and not a technical one i think that's how we've always started so whether you end up with a software license agreement to our platform called the io.tt the thing we always make sure is that Sharpend, as a, as a creative and a strategic partner, is is doing the upfront work to help you find out you know, what's the right experience, who's your audience, based on that audience, what's the right technology, how do you inter- integrate it onto your product. So there's a kind of all of this stuff that we do upfront, which which other people just don't do. And I think that going back to your thing about the the kind of the technical solutions, you know, if you if you sell the technical solution to a customer, but which is great. Congratulations. But getting it from we've now bought the technology through to we now got it live in market, there's a lot of things that need to happen at that point. And if you go tech first, it's quite difficult. But if you go creative and strategic first, and you've always got an anchor point to why you're doing these programs in the first place, we've just found it to be a more efficient uh, way forward. In terms of the the technologies that we're looking to to kind of back, I think, as it were, I think we've got from a retail perspective, we're seeing a lot more, um, a lot more kind of touch points being deployed in retail um, across the standard technologies, right? So, you know, QR code touch points, for example, um, Estee Lauder companies using QR codes in all of their stores and all of their doors, which are generally where they're selling their products within someone else's retail space, uh, linking through to things like virtual trial. So I think one of the insights is um, with uh, with lipstick, for example, after you've tried like four lipsticks, it's very difficult to know what the fifth one looks like because your lips are kind of stained. So virtual trial allows you to have a kind of an unlimited uh, testing moment in store. The, um, the, the work that Levi's are doing right now, so being able to use NFC in their stores to be able to link people to, okay, we haven't got this in your size here, but if you tap this NFC touch point, we'll be able to tell you if we have it in the back room or if you have it in a, in a store nearby. So there's a kind of blend of inventory management with, uh, with customer engagement through NFC. Um, AR, augmented reality, is, is kind of, for me, it's very difficult to find the the scale opportunities within augmented reality. In terms of QR and NFC touch points, you just update the digital experience whenever you want to, and there's kind of less front end cost because you're working with um, with less kind of comprehensive packages. But you know, doing things like augmented reality installations for pop ups. You know, so if someone like uh, John Lewis, for example, which is a retailer. They'll be communicating a lot of Levi's waterless initiatives through AR. It just gives you a bit of a shareable moment, a bit of a stunt in store. But in terms of meaningful methods of bridging uh, people from online to, or offline to online, there, there's nothing better than QR codes and NFC right now. I'm, I'm sure you'll remember, Eric, the impending takeover of Beacons about four years ago. And uh, I, I don't really hear those being spoken about too much anymore. So for me, it's it's kind of like what are the things that were there at the beginning and what are the things that are still there? And that kind of guides you to what are going to be the right choices to make for at least the next couple of years anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it does seem to be the, the simplicity wins the day more often than not when it comes to, you know, IOT solutions, despite, you know, the fact that there's a lot of other solutions that might be superior in some, you know, in some metric, but uh, in the end of the day, being able to, like you said, roll something out uh, in mass across, 
you know, multiple countries and uh, thousands of uh, endpoints. Um, that's a technical challenge. Let's talk a little bit about then the the value that the brands are looking for and the value that the, the customers are looking for. You already touched on a couple of those in the examples that you gave, and they were quite different, right? One is kind of inventory management. The other is a user experience that's quite unique to people testing lipstick, right? That the, the color sticks. And then after you, you do it two or three times, you don't really have a pure color anymore. Uh, so we already have two very distinct use cases. And one of the interesting things I think with IoT is that there's just this tremendously long tail of use cases that might be very high value for specific companies and specific scenarios. But I imagine there's also a short list of use cases that you basically talk to many of your your customers about what would be the short list for you that are the things every brand should be at least considering it's a great question i'm, I'm really glad you asked it in the, in the way that you did as well because there, there's something that i just feel is such an unfair advantage to, to kind of working with or at sharp end as well which is that we work with bauman we work with pepsi we work with um campari we work with i'm thinking what the fourth well, estee lauder companies and all of the brands actually have the same problems, but they all talk about them slightly differently, in my opinion, anyway, which is how do I learn about who buys and uses my products? How do I engage and convert a point of sale? And how do I build new ecosystems around my customers? And, and those three things, generally, if, if you change the language and you make it more high-end for luxury, more promotional for, for CPG, generally, you end up with those three use cases. And, and that, for me, is, is exactly what, connected products are, are there to do which is get you direct to your customer so i can now understand who's engaging with my products i can deliver an experience that captures their first party data so i can now start to understand who that person actually is i can start to understand their preferences i can then start to deliver more meaningful engagement a point of sale you know not even just through connected products but also connected retail experiences you know we've got interactive services live in global travel retail we've got image recognition driven from QR codes or, uh, you know, in retailers that want to get the, the kind of the brand in hand moment. I mean, there, there's so many different ways you can talk about expressions of IoT in retail and product, but generally I think those three kind of problem statements or opportunity areas are, are, are the ones that we always look out for. And I truly believe that if you, if you distill most of the conversations down, they, they end up in, in one, two or three of, of those statements. Okay. And what about from the, the customer perspective? So, I mean, the, the end user in this case, the end, uh, the end consumer, what do you think they, I mean, do you think they're even conscious that they're using a new technology or I guess, uh, you know, I'm just thinking from my perspective here and I use QR codes all the time. It's, it's kind of unconscious. And if you ask me what other IOT t technologies are you encountering in, in the products, even though I'm in the industry, I really couldn't answer you right now. There, there probably are things I bump into all the time. Um, and I don't process them. So how do you think the end consumer, I mean, is there a learning journey that sometimes they need to go through and you need to kind of figure out how to educate them, how to use a new technology or you know, where, where are we on the user experience today? So, th so there's, a, there's a couple of things. And, and, and I, I would say that I do believe that the kind of sharp end it, given, I mean, even if you, if you look at the record and the history of kind of the work that we've done with brands to, to deploy QR codes, NFC tags and all that stuff, I feel like we've done more than almost anyone to, to kind of get these technologies into the mainstream outside of, of course, the, the progress that was happening in Asia, because I, I always look back to, and maybe you can kind of empathize. I look back to a world, maybe even like nearly 10 years ago now when QR codes went through their kind of first proliferation. And, 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 but the thing is that the brands and, 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 and people who are actually deploying these QR codes weren't giving a shit about the experience. So I remember scanning QR codes and it going through to desktop landing pages on my mobile. I remember dead links. I remember QR codes that were too small to scan. I remember, do you remember all of these things that happened like 10 years ago? And everyone was like, QR codes are shit. Like, do you remember? And, and then it kind of just died out and everyone was like, okay, well, and then there was probably maybe only four people globally left going, no, I still think there's an opportunity for QR codes to deliver, you know, value to people. And, and that's kind of really, I think what, what me as, as kind of the founder and CEO of Sharpend, I was, I was one of those people that said, look, I get it. And I understand that the first go wasn't particularly successful, but I understand why. And what I'm trying to do now is take a different approach and say to customers, look, the technologies are the same, but the experience needs to be better. 
so it's a kind of at the time they were sort of let's say reintroduced in apostrophes to society and I'm, I'm very much talking about kind of the us and the uk at, at, at this point in time when they were reintroduced and absolute was delivering you cool stuff through their products or malibu was helping you get the most out of summer or nivea was telling you how to make the most out of their skincare products or you know all, all of these different things that the customer was actually going shit i remember scanning this before and it was rubbish but i'm, I'm now getting something really meaningful so changing the customer psychology around what these things actually do in the first place was kind of step number one. Step number two was was to kind of wait, I think, for for the technology and, and the kind of the OEMs to, to 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 mature and to be able to things like I remember jumping my ass off like when uh, when when the smartphone operator started to make the QR code scannable through the camera because that was that was one of the biggest barriers, right? Which is moving it from having to download a QR reader app, which is super nerdy to then just being able to launch your camera and scan the same QR code. So that was a big turning point. Next thing that happened was, of course, COVID. Um, the ability to you know, go into or, or kind of the idea that I went into lockdown and, and kind of was thinking, well, what is the thing that's going to um, that's gonna kind of change people's behavior around these, these well, this particular technology? Because we're still only talking about QR codes at this point. I went into lockdown, didn't realize, did, or didn't kind of think, what else could I be doing to because I'd already worked with the world's biggest brands, already done cool stuff through their products, and it still wasn't kind of catching on as, as a scale opportunity. Brands were still kind of having it within the innovation mindset. Let's try it. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it worked pretty nicely. What else can we be doing? And then coming out of lockdown and seeing that there were QR codes on barbershop windows, restaurant tables, florists, all, all this kind of stuff. And then it was just like, wow, like something happened in the last couple of weeks, and I'm not quite sure what it is, but we need to scale up and that's kind of really what happened from a QR code perspective. And then, you know, and now we are where we are and everyone knows what QR codes do. They're seeing them on every single product. And, and one of the, the kind of the uh, intelligent things that I came up with a few days ago was that QR codes are now firmly part of the world's um, visual language. So you kind of see QR codes pretty much in every, um, in every store, in any shelf that you look at, there'll be at least one product that has a QR code, you look at print advertising, it's got QR. It's just not surprising to see QR codes everywhere now, which it was a couple of years ago, which is quite interesting. The other technology that that kind of I think is really um, emerging in a way, although it's performing fantastically for, for client campaigns, is, is near-field communication, NFC, right? So NFC is generally what we're using for advocating for kind of higher price point items, you know, cosmetics, fashion, um, handbags, etc. Because it gives you just a more premium experience. It, it does, it's not as visually interruptive as a QR code because in some creative teams in these cosmetics businesses, QR codes just wouldn't fly. So we've been working very, very hard with you know, tag manufacturers, um, everyone else within the kind of supply chain, you know, emblem uh, providers and stuff like that to, to kind of make sure that we've got integrated NFC solutions ready to go to market. The next thing after that is, okay, the, the tags in the product – how do you let people know? At least a QR code is, is a visual call to action, right? It looks like a QR code. It behaves like a QR code. An NFC tag is, is when done properly, completely invisible. So what we've been working with brands is kind of creating like domains where you can go to things like tap.io.tt and you can see exactly how to use NFC, which handsets does it come on, uh, where's the reader. So you kind of really guide people through that interaction process. And actually what we see now on the, on the back end, so from the io.tt side, is that people who use NFC are more likely to keep using NFC. And we find that QR code scanners are much more likely to do kind of one or two engagements a month where NFC users might be kind of doing five or six. So that's a kind of really interesting um, uh, learning from us, which is getting people to within the NFC ecosystem kind of keeps them there. And QR codes, I think, based on just kind of paradox of choice because they're everywhere, are more likely to scan less products. So. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I'm, you know, I'm here in the in the China bubble, and um, QR codes are just such a part of the landscape. You use them every day for everything, and uh, it becomes very subconscious. Um, and there's obviously a huge advantage of the fact that they're more or less free, right? It's a it's a printed image. It can be a digital image, but it's just an image, um, and so it's easy to modify, easy to put in any form factor. Um, uh, whereas you know, yeah, it's interesting the way you describe the difference between uh, QR and NFC as NFC being kind of a, a more premium experience. Um, what is the, uh, so QR, I would say is, is basically free minus 
you know, the, well, there's the labor cost of, of kind of distributing them. Yeah. Um, for NFC, where's the cost point, uh, the cost point right now for, um, I guess, on the one hand, the, uh, the hardware and the, on the other hand, kind of the software integration, any, any, any setup required to deploy these? Yeah, so, so the hardware is, is, is already there, which is it's in people's devices already. So iPhones, Androids, etc. So but then you'd also hardware. need to deploy that like in, um, uh, in a bottle or any, whatever product that you... Precisely. Precisely, yes. Yeah. So I was just thinking from the customer side, the hardware is already set. From a, from a tag perspective, I mean, we, we work very, very closely with the likes of NXP, um, SmartTrack, Identive, all, all the kind of who we consider to be like the, the kind of the industry pioneers who can work with us on trying to reduce the cost down. You know, there's always a, a rogue NFC supplier who says, actually, we've got a two or three dollar cent NFC tag, but it kind of never quite comes to fruition. And everyone just kind of keeps waiting and it slows down the market because everyone's kind of waiting. And what we generally do is we generally work with a rule of thumb that an NFC tag is going to be between 10 and 15 dollar cents for an order quantity under 500,000. We give that as a, as a cost scenario. And then we're either pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised at the final cost but but just kind of having a flag in the ground there is, is generally what we try and do and then we can always refine it as we go depending on you know, how complex is it to integrate you know if you're someone like levi's and you're putting an uh, an nfc tag into the back patch then of course there's you know production processes that you're going to need to test you know how many washes does it stand all this kind of stuff so very much depending on the um on the brand, on the use case, on the product, you're going to have more or less complexity. You know, uh, Clinique, for example, working directly with the packaging team, we were um, producing a base label that was NFC enabled, um, where we'd be able to kind of print the call to action of visiting tap.io.tt, but also carry the NFC tag as well, because it had a slight, um, my, my, my language is, is, is running out when I get deeper and deeper into technicalities, but because there's a kind of a bit of a gap between the base and, and the actual kind of table or the surface it, it means the the nfc antenna isn't going to get smashed every time they put the product down as well so just having those kind of considerations makes quite a difference as well but generally like i said i mean you're not going to find a pepsi can with a you know nfc tag on it anytime soon but you will really see more and more beauty fashion and luxury products coming to market with nfc because everyone wants to have a direct customer relationship so hmm. Do you see companies moving into life cycle management? I know, you know my, my wife is always talking to me about the, the secondhand marketplace for some of these yeah. luxury brands. And it's, uh, it's pretty wild um, how, you know, in some, I guess in some cases, the, the value even grows just because of scarcity. But um, um, I, I can imagine that there's now a lot of growing use cases for, for kind of life cycle management. But then, of course, the NFC tag has to survive for that life cycle. Are you seeing... And I guess the other part of that would be just kind of tracking this uh, through, you know, yeah. through the supply chain. So if there's a quality issue, you can hopefully trace that back and not have to do a big recall. But uh, how are you seeing this deployed in in the the life cycle of a product? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and it's actually something we've spent a long time thinking about. And what we came to the understanding of, in, in terms of in, like our own understanding, is that the world doesn't need yet another. Um, by the apple of, a, of an iot platform and apostrophes that says they can do everything for everyone right so so we, we were kind of in that process of going well should we do traceability should we do supply chain transparency should we do all of this anti-counterfeit and stuff like that i mean we've got authentication modules on the platform but what we did instead is we kind of we we, we looked around and said actually who's doing supply chain better than we ever could and, and actually i think the language is, is now kind of calling it product clouds so a lot of people are now calling themselves product clouds um, but what we want to try and do now is find that right partner who we can integrate with. Because ultimately, when you talk about connected products or retail or any of the other ways that, that we can have this discussion, what you really come down to is identity management, right? Which is every physical product having an identity um, in the cloud. So what we want to do now is we want to find the right partner. And that's me kind of pretending that we haven't found the right partner and we're just kind of waiting to announce it where we can deeply, deeply integrate the platforms. And the person who is generating that kind of master ID is then tracking it through the supply chain to give the brands that level of intelligence. And then as soon as that product goes into the store and as soon as it's picked up by the customer, that identity then changes into a customer-facing experience, which is designed, built, and managed by the io.tt platform. And what you've got at that point is you've got best-in-class um, supply chain and engagement slash experience um, within within kind of the same 
platform, which for us is a, a much more friendly way to work in terms of joining together in the ecosystem rather than everyone just taking yet more funding to build out yet more modules when actually the best thing to do would just be to do some integrations. So yeah, absolutely. I think the next thing, once you've got an identity on a product is is then to start thinking, well, where else can this benefit the wider business? Because I think you always need to make sure that connected products are delivering on business and brand objectives. And what we've done up until now to kind of validate the opportunity is work on brand objectives and what we're now looking at doing is incorporating more and more business objectives into that so yeah yeah i love that approach i was i was chatting with a guest on the podcast a few weeks ago and they built um kind of a a a lego brick approach to building ai applications where they took a bunch of startups that had good functionality and they built some middleware to tie them all together and then they just distribute revenue, you know, based on what functionality is used. And I thought that's a beautiful approach because most people are just going to say, let's let's kind of backwards engineer that and um, and build some kind of B grade, um, you know, software that, that basically does the job. Um, but then, you, like you said, you're just spending uh, venture capital emulating what somebody else has done. It's uh, it's going to be much healthier for the industry if people focus, do things really excellently, and then partner. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the, the um, thing is about the, the early days of the IoT was was horrendous, right? It was full of it was full of well funded charlatans. That that's kind of the way that I'd put it, right? And everyone was saying we can do everything for everyone. So they were kind of just in a bit of a land grab exercise, saying no, you have to stay with us and you have to work with us across everything. And then they were farming out agency briefs to agencies, tech briefs to tech platforms, and no one was actually moving forward for the first couple of years. And, and we were very much a I think maybe we still are to a certain extent, like a bit of a pariah in the industry because we're the ones who've been calling people out for for the last seven years and saying, look, yes, you've done a bunch of empty partnerships, but where's the case studies? Like who's actually rolled this stuff out? Because at the same time, everyone's been kind of slowing down the market. They've been slowing down adoption of these technologies. And you've seen what's happened with COVID. And it's no coincidence that brands are embracing these technologies more than ever. And I'm not saying they're all working with Sharpen, but it's also at the same time where a lot of those kind of previous players are sort of running out of steam or have even exited the market completely. You know, there's a, there's a well-documented timeline of a certain, a certain few partners that had said, you know, we're going to have a, a, a dollar cent tag. So, so kind of what they do is they raise shitloads of money. They go and just hire a massive sales team. They say to every single customer in the world, why are you going to spend Ten dollars with smart or ten dollar cents with smart trade. We'll give it to you for one dollar cent in the next twelve months, and then all the companies say, "No, we're going to slow down and we're going to wait for these guys." And those guys never come to market. Do you see what I mean? So stuff like that happened uh, quite a lot, and and the same thing with platforms as well. You know, people saying we have to use our platform because we're the only one in the market, and and then and it would just slow down adoption. And at the same time, you've got you know, all, well, for the first five years we were privately funded, so I wasn't taking a salary for maybe like three years of Sharpens. Um, uh, early story and then we took a little bit of funding to build out our platform nothing outrageous and we, we kind of feel that we've done things very honestly and i think there's a few people in the iot space that haven't been particularly honest and i think those people have now run out of steam entirely and now it's a good time to start really trying to think about how to create a more friendly ecosystem because it wasn't particularly friendly before because it was full of very competitive uh, people because they were having to justify a lot of investment to a lot of investors do you see what i'm saying yeah, yeah. Well, this uh, dip in the venture capital markets and the in the general capital markets uh, is often healthy for a, a new industry, right? Because it forces yeah. everybody to focus on making, you know, making revenue, making profit, um, and uh, building a, a sustainable business. And also, just I think just being being nice, being nice people, I think is is the main thing, and 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 making sure that making sure that we enjoy what we're doing. I mean, you, you've been in the space for a long time. I've been in the space for a long time. I'm so, I'm so proud and satisfied of where we're up to right now, which is that brands have moved from kind of, you know, us having these kind of weird niche events in strange parts of dodgy countries in Europe to now kind of being a part of the main stage conversations about this is a big thing and this is a big unlock. You know, there's, there's 8 billion people in the world and there's seven to 10 trillion consumer products made every single year. And I think people are starting to really understand the shape and size of this opportunity and really starting to get behind it. And a lot of the people who have been, been in it from the beginning should feel very proud of themselves that they kind of back the right horse. So. Well, it's, there's another angle of complexity here, which is the geographic angle, right? So mm-hmm. even if you're focused on you know, one domain um, and doing that uh, at a high level, 
um, you're working with customers who, you know, you're working with Levi's, they sell clothing around the world. Even if you were saying, we're going to focus on the UK market, well, some consumer buys that and then they move to Japan, they move to India, they move to South America. Um, and so, you know, the, the product itself is going to, to migrate. Um, where are we today in these technologies on global, global standards? Um, it, you know, are they able to develop uh, one solution and roll that out around the world? Or are, are they doing this uh, regionally? How do they manage geographic complexity? How, is this even a, an issue that needs to be um, deeply considered today? Um, I am going to answer it in a very, very straightforward manner, which is GDPR and CCPA compliance kind of wiped out a couple of IoT players in, immediately um, because their platforms were just not set up to handle PII very intelligently. So that's, that's the first stage of compliance. You need to make sure that GDPR and CCPA is kind of baked in. The second thing is kind of data management. So understanding that you're able to process customer data on the brand's behalf. So that's another part of it. From a technology standards perspective, I mean, the QR code is the QR code, right? And just making sure that it goes to an ID that isn't going to be able to be showing you know, something funky uh, if you scan it in one country versus the other. Um, NFC tags as well because it's a hidden and locked URL it's got generally less chance of being abused and better for things like authentication but from a from a kind of a standards perspective I mean it, IOT is very much becoming a thing and therefore connected products is also becoming a thing and and connected product platforms are now becoming a key consideration so someone like us who's built their platform for enterprise brand owners is in really in a really good position because we designed everything around scalability, security, and compliance, right? So, and those are the three things that you need. Once, once kind of the innovation guy or girl has done their job and said, hey, we're going to be rolling out QR codes or NFC, eventually there's going to be someone from procurement, from IT, from legal who pops up and says, hang on a second, who, who are these people over there? We need to kind of run them through the proper processes and just making sure you can fly through that from an enterprise evaluation is, is pretty critical. The thing that I would say that is, is becoming a very key discussion topic is privacy. So if you're needing to put privacy policies between the QR code scan and the end experience, you know, being able to have that language ready to go and off the shelf is, is very, very important because, it, because that does change per market. Uh, but generally, the, the problems are the same, and it's just making a couple of tweaks to your overall proposition that allows you to get, get scale out very quickly. Yeah, you're right. GDPR has been useful in terms of, uh, I mean, just very, very directly setting a standard that uh, you know, other countries have, you know, to, to some extent, have, or brands have basically have adopted, right, as a, as a global standard yeah. to some degree. Um, let's talk a bit about who you're working with. You've, you've mentioned the brand, so we don't need to go there. But from a, a, an individual perspective, I think you mentioned that maybe early days you were working more with the innovation teams. Yeah. I've got to imagine there's a lot of people that have a say in this. There's there's marketing, there's IT, there's also manufacturing. If you're trying to deploy, yeah. you know, if you're trying to insert a chip in the production line. Yeah. Um, so who, you know, who's the buyer, who's writing the check, who's yeah. influencing, you know, who has a voice at the table here? Yeah, I wish there was a, I wish there was a standard answer for you. I mean, generally we find that from an experience and an execution perspective, it works within digital and brand, but to be able to get these programs to market, you need, um, operations, mm -hmm. legal, IT more so, um, and, and just kind of being able to have a, a, a kind of a, I think also just kind of going back to to, to that because again I'm sort of answering in real time as opposed to reading from a from a notebook is is that the brands have to be able to trust someone like Sharpen to 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 answer the questions that they're not asking and be able to bring those questions to the table. Have you thought about activating this in retail? Have you thought about training your brand ambassadors or training your store staff to be able to speak about the technology? Oh, no, actually, I'd never thought about that. What would you suggest? Well, we can create like a retail activation toolkit, do a training session with a couple of your key regional leads that will then allow, then allow the message to get down into your store staff. Do you see, things like that, it kind of even the things that people aren't thinking about at the beginning, the further these programs go, our job is really to make sure that, that they're able to... Um, to, to kind of have a trusted partner. And I think the other key ingredient to Sharpend as an agency rather than the platform, which is io.tt, is that every single person who sits as a client lead in our business is, is X brand. So we haven't taken people from agencies. We've taken people from Pernod Ricard, from, uh, from uh, Revlon, from um, 
uh, Campari Group. So, so the ability for the brands to kind of have a brand manager next to them who's actually in-house in our agency gives them a lot of comfort. Uh, and that's probably one of our, our things as well. So almost having someone in-house who feels like an in-house person within our building makes makes a big difference. Mm, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Well, you, you mentioned that uh, you're raising some money now. Uh, I think we've already talked a lot about um, the you know the the earlier years and about the the COVID years and, and kind of the ramp up yeah. there. Uh, if you look forward three years, five years in the future, um, you know what's on your product roadmap now, and and what are you excited about in the in the coming decade? Um, I'm excited about looking forward. To be honest with you, if if I, if I can answer it without kind of having to, to wipe a, a solitary tear. But I think the idea that, you know, like I said, I mean, we, we took the hard path, right? We, we created the first kind of IOT agency um, eight years ago. And at that point you're privately funded. You're, you know, growing very slowly, very organically. We took a couple of million quid to build out the platform, but we're by no means have we ever been kind of overfunded or had, you know, two, three years runway as it were. So what, what I'm really looking forward to doing now that we've validated product market fit, you know, generate good revenues, work with amazing brands, have a clear roadmap for scale is just to raise the right amount of funding that just allows us to look forward and not have to do kind of three monthly cash flow forecasts and all that kind of stuff that you need to do as a kind of bit of a hustler in the industry. I think the other things that really interest me over the next 10 years are kind of moving from what is the IoT to let's give it a try to we've now scaled it across the business to what do we now do with the data? Because if you think, like I said, I mean, seven to trillion, seven to 10 trillion consumer products are made every year. If even 10% of those are activated, then that is a huge new unlock for data and insights for these brands. And I think doing something meaningful with that data is going to be one of the next big unlocks. And, and we're kind of thinking about that already. And that's what I'm very, very excited about. And I think generally just trying to um, just trying to understand what the ecosystem might look like. Um, and I think that we've really had to focus on sort of creating an industry to build a business. And, and I feel like we've, we've done our part, you've done yours. There's other people around us that have kind of helped to create this industry. And I'm just really interested to see what businesses, um, occupy this new space, uh, in the next kind of five to seven years. So, yeah, it, it sounds like you're very much focused on, um, NFC and QR and it, for, for good reason. Um, there's a few other technologies that are starting to get much broader adoption in the IoT space. I don't know to what extent they actually are. I mean, these are more device technologies. So things yeah. like MBIoT, LTEM, uh, just 5G in general in terms of enabling new experiences. Are these things that you could uh, imagine kind of being integrated into your platform in the coming years? Or um, right now, do you, do you see those as being for the product categories that you're working on not particularly relevant? Well, it's it's definitely not about relevance. Um, it, it's more for me, like I, I think less about the devices and more about the customers. Like w what are customers using and how can we create new touch points for them to engage with? And that's why we've settled a kind of NFC and QR over the past couple of years with a bit of augmented reality, a bit of image recognition. What we're now looking at is kind of, well, what, what would kind of devices that have persistent communication with the IO.TT platform look like? And, and like I said, Eric, I go back to the... Um, to the beacons thing right do you remember when everyone was pivoting towards beacons and doing beacon integrations and speaking to i think it was estimo you remember that name <laughs> no that, uh, not i'm trying to blank there Est estimo was uh was kind of the the big kind of beacons company and everyone was speaking to them about how do we integrate you into the platform and stuff like that i mean what we'll always try and be do is be guided by the use cases you know what are the brands doing how do we make their lives easier is there a customer engagement opportunity and i think that will always be our filter because i think there's going to be much better smarter more technical people who can think about the other um, types of kind of iot applications and how to integrate those and then we can always follow their lead because I, I don't want to be the the IoT generalist who knows everything about every particular field, because at that point you, you don't know much about anything. But I think from our side, I mean, we just really want to be the thought leaders and the industry pioneers of kind of QR codes and NFC integrated into products, delivering good experiences and giving brands uh, new data and insights. And I think we've got a, we've got the opportunity to build a really successful company just focusing on that for at least the next couple of years. Yeah, great. Well, there's maybe one more topic you just brought up here that we should touch on, which is this topic of analytics and insights. I yeah. think we've been talking a lot about engagement so far, and and you know, but uh, not so much about then what are brands doing with the data. I think you've already touched on the the privacy issues, 
Uh, so maybe we don't need to go too deep there. But when it comes to analytics and insight, what do you have on the platform? Are you working with partners? And then you know, how are how are brands using this information to improve their their business and experiences today? Yeah, so I think I'll kind of go back to. Um, so, so let me kind of not try and get sued by about six of my clients straight after this podcast go live and talk generally about the KPIs, right? So the first one is, are people engaging with my products? And that's an easy metric to evaluate and set a KPI against. Second one is, can we get people to re-engage with our products? So within a unique ID scan, can we get the same device interacting with it twice, three, four times, et cetera? I'll give you an example. Um, we went live with Bauman uh, a couple of weeks ago for Paris Fashion Week, launching their Pokemon collab. And we brought kind of Pokemon Go to life through NFC in their products. So you could kind of buy different products and access different Pokemon characters and be able to unlock legendaries based on having three or four Batman items and stuff like that. So there's a really interesting thing about, you know, can we get people to start interacting with more products and build like a product graph around that person? Uh, can we capture first party data? Um, so can we capture things like email addresses with opt-in? How long are people spending on the experience? Um, and I think those are probably the main KPIs that we're looking at right now because there's an inherent media value in connected products as well, right? If you scan a, a code and and you stay on an experience for two minutes, there's an inherent media value. You know, how, how much would brands spend elsewhere for you to spend two minutes looking at their content? So there's all these different kind of metrics that you really need to understand brands and brand marketing to understand how to sell it back to the business properly as a success. Um, and I think those are the... Those are the kind of key ones right now. Okay, interesting. Yeah, we're working maybe uh, after a podcast, I'll have to pick your brain on a project we're working on right now. Cool. Uh, well, I think we've covered a, a good bit of ground here, Cameron. Um, anything we haven't touched on that uh, folks should know? Well, th this definitely isn't a plug. It's more like an industry resource, but, but we spent quite a bit of money speaking to thousands of people last year from the US and the UK about what they exactly want from connected products. You know, what are you scared about? How do you feel about your data being used? What type of experiences do you want? Would you pay more for a connected product? What do you think about these technologies? Um, if you go to sharpend.com uh, and you can find it within our work section, um, it's called the Connected Experience Report, and there's a free download there. Uh, and there's just loads of good uh, there's loads of good insights about how people actually feel about connected products if you're interested to find out more. So. Awesome. Cameron, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Great, Eric. Thanks ever so much for having me. All right. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at IoT1.com.